My name is Bob Tribe, and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Valley to Vietnam is a joint effort between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America, Chapter 500. It is our intent to trace the arc of experience between Sacramento and Vietnam for our local Vietnam era vets. Today, our guest is Jerry Chong, who is a proud Marine, former member of Mike Company of the 3rd Battalion, 7th Regiment of the 1st Marine Division, which is probably the most famous of all the Marine Divisions. Um, Jerry, you welcome, first of all. Uh, thank you, you Bob, and thank you for Sacramento Library for having me here. Well, we're very happy to, and honored to have you here today. Um, so Jerry, your star story starts with your parents, uh, both having been born in China. That is correct, Bob. Uh, both of my parents are from China came to the United States about, my father, when he came, he was about 16 years old uh -huh. in the 1930s. Okay. My mother came as a um, picture of bride in the 1940s. Okay. Both of my parents um, do not, did not speak English uh, very well, and if they did, it was just rudimentary. Okay. And so we, um, they were in Kalinga in California, which is down by the Fresno, King County uh -huh. area, and so, uh, we lived there until I was about five years old. And then from there, uh, we moved to San Francisco, uh, where I went to school, and basically that's where I joined the Marine Corps. So you moved to, moved to Chinatown in San Francisco? Yes. And you told me your family was the poorest of the poor. <laughs> yes, uh, we, we were, <laughs> and that we were, although, you know, certainly, you know, I didn't know it at that time, you know, we don't Most know. Most poor people, I think, never know it. I mean, <laughs> we didn't have much when I was a kid, but n neither did anybody else on the street. So. Right, well, we just thought everybody else lived like that. I sure. mean, there were seven of us living in a one-room apartment, um, then eventually went to a three-room apartment, and these apartments had communal bathrooms, and right. community garbage cans, and community uh, uh, baths, you know, where you had to just, you know, you, you didn't have it. You had to go outside to go there. And then... Um, kind of when, like being in the Marine Corps. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> right. It was kind of preparing me for the Marine Corps. Yeah, and then exactly. we, and then later on when I was uh, in high school, uh, we uh, were able to get into one of the housing projects okay. in Chinatown, which was called Pring uh, you know, public housing project. Yeah. And I thought we had died and gone to heaven because, gosh, you know, and now I have my own room with my two brothers. So there's three of us to this little room. Yeah. But what was more important, we had our own bathroom. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and we had home bath, you know. You didn't have to go outside, you know, to um, you know, go to the bathroom yeah. or uh, take a bath. Now, you told me that... Um, your mother started walking you down the street when you were to start school, and the closest school was the Catholic school, St. Mary's. That is correct, right. And so that's how I, went, how, how I started. You started the first grade not knowing how to speak English. That must have been a little bit of a hindrance. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, of course at that time, you know, you don't realize how much of a hindrance it is or how difficult it was. Um, you know, my mother didn't, how, didn't know how to speak English, so you know, when she left the apartment, and then that, that was on Kearney Street, and we walked uh -huh. up Clay through Grant Avenue, which is right in the middle of Chinatown, up to Stockton. Um, the first school we hit was St. Mary's Chinese Mission, you know? Yeah. So, and then there, so my mother ended up talking to some of the other mothers that were there, and of course, they encouraged her to, you know, to sign us up to go to St. Mary's. If we had walked another half a block, we would have been at Commodore Stockton Public School, you know? Okay. So were most of the students there Chinese? Yes, all of the students oh. there were, were okay. Chinese. Uh, St. Mary's Chinese Mission, you know, was composed of all the Chinese kids that, um, and, and almost all of us lived in, in and around Chinatown. I think I would have liked to be the only Anglo kid in the class. <laughs> that would have been fun. Um, so you went, you, you go to Catholic grammar school, and then you went to Catholic high school too, Sacred Heart. Correct. I, uh, f from there, uh, I uh, attended Sacred Heart High School for four years, which was oh. an all-boys school. Wow. So I became, I was basically what you call socially retarded, you know. <laughs> Uh, so when I graduated from uh, Sacred Heart High School, um, I was um, a student, 
you know, it's I good got for someone who started school without speaking the language. <laughs> right, that's that's true. But then that's the nature of our culture was to, right. which value education and and to do always do our best because we didn't want to dishonor or shame our parents. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I'm one of five children. You know, there was three boys, including myself, and two girls. And so all the three boys, that's my older brother, myself, and my younger brother, all went to Sacred Heart High School. Uh -huh. um, how do we go? You know, well, we pay for ourselves. Our parents didn't pay for it, pay yeah. for us. We you know, did newspaper, shine shoes, you know, did all kinds of work, so clean toilet, own, whatever. You paid your own tuition. Then. That's correct, and, yeah. the, and, and the books, yeah. you know, um, because, well. you know, because it was, a, it was, it was, it was a good school school. You oh know, yeah, it's it was very, good. very, it was excellent for preparing yeah. you for college. But, you know, it was, it was an all boys school. So, you know, I mean, there was, there was, so when I graduated from Sacred Heart High School, I went to San Francisco City College. And, you know, my goodness, that was a co-ed college. <laughs> and wow, you know, I had a great time <laughs> in the college, you oh, know. Yeah. And I, you were living on your own then. That's correct. So I had moved, moved out and I was living on my own. That separates some of the parents overseeing <laughs> kind of your activities. <laughs> that, that's bit. exactly correct. Yeah. And then, yeah. so what happens then is that, you know, I had a great time. Only problem is <laughs> I, I did terrible in school, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, but I ended up graduating from, barely graduating from San Francisco City College with an Associate of Arts degree. And then I went to San Francisco State College. Right. I lasted there one semester and got disqualified for academic deficiency. And this is basically in early 1966. That's correct. So uh -huh. if you don't have a student deferment, then you can expect to be going into the service. That is correct. Absolutely and correct. You, know. you, you felt like you owed your country something. Correct. Um, you know, uh, if, if I had stayed in China, if I had been born in China, like my... Yeah, a lot of my parents, if they hadn't come to the United States, I would have never had the opportunities that I have. Yes, we were poor, but I was able to get an education. And if I was in China, there was no <laughs> way I would have gotten the type of education that I did or have the opportunities that I had. And, you know, I, I know that, you know, my father and my parents had always told me or encouraged me the fact that, you know, no, the United States is not perfect, you know, in terms of, er in, in terms of, uh, uh, treatment of people and all that, and not always fair, but it's still a heck of a lot better country than any other country in the world. So, and you know, the other thing too is that I had grown up, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, in a Catholic high school and a Catholic grammar school, and you know, we were all very patriotic. We had always, you know, believed very strongly um, in, uh, uh, in in the United States, and uh, and and so. I felt that you know I had a debt at least to do my part in regards to uh, the United States, especially since at that time I was in favor of the Vietnam War. I supported it, and I was and to me I was thinking if I was going to support the Vietnam War and if I was prepared to send say you know we ought to send our young folks over there to fight, I should be willing to do the same thing myself. I shouldn't be asking somebody else to do something that I wasn't going I wasn't willing to do. So why the Marine Corps? Well, selfishly, I thought that I, if I joined the Marine Corps, uh, that would be my best chance to survive a war, you know, because my thinking at that time was, you know, gee, if I was going to go to war, it would be best to go with a fighting unit that was composed of volunteers, not draftees. Volunteers would be ones who chose to go. And I thought, hey, that'd be pretty good. My chances of making it through the war would be a lot better if I was in the Marine Corps. Little not thinking and not realizing Marine Corps also got sent into the heaviest fighting. Yeah. You know, so I said, hey, you know, it, it doesn't get any better than that, right? I can just, you know, usually if you get drafted, you're going to serve two years. Yeah, I can serve two years in the Marine Corps instead, yeah. you know, and, uh, and I'll be a lot more safer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bad thinking, but uh, uh, so after boot camp, then you go to Pendleton for advanced infantry training. Correct. The uh, normal training uh, cycle for uh, Marines are, you know, eight weeks of boot camp. Then from there, they assign you to a uh, specific what's called MOS, Military Occupation, Occupation Specialty. Specialty. And of course, being two years, 
I was assigned to infantry, which is 0300. Uh -huh. And then from there, you're sent to advanced infantry training, which is an additional four weeks of infantry training in uh, uh, Camp Pendleton, uh -huh. where they have you running up and down hills. And then an, an additional two weeks then for your particular infantry uh, specialty. Like okay. for instance, like rifleman, which is what I was, which would be 0311. Then there's machine gunner, which is 0331. Uh, 0341s uh, and 0351s, which is like rock, uh, rockets and demolition and 106s. Yeah, right. These are all the different yeah. ones. And so they had those different schools for, for those different uh, MOSs f within the infantry itself. But I was basically a grunt. And then after that, you're sent to Hawaii. Well, I was w uh, one of those guys that, uh, that instead of being sent immediately to Vietnam, which you know, which a large number of my boot camp uh, uh, comrades were. They, they got immediately right out of boot camp. They went to uh, advanced infantry training, and then they got, then they got, then they got sent over to Vietnam. Uh -huh. I I was one of those that they sent to uh, Hawaii to build up the Fifth Marine Division. Now the Fifth Marine Division uh, at that time is you know, it's composed of the Twenty Sixth, Twenty Seventh, and Twenty Eighth Marine Regiment. The 26th Marine Regiment had deployed already to Vietnam, uh -huh. and so I was assigned to the 27th Regiment, uh, and where they were just starting to build that up. and And the plan was to deploy the entire uh, battalion to, to to Vietnam all at the same time, all together, right. having trained together and fought together. But uh, in 1967, in the summer there was all these uh, Marine Hill fights that happened in which Marine took tremendous casualties in these uh, battles, uh, which were basically what we, call, uh, we refer to as hill fights. Um, and the Marine casualties uh, had gotten pretty high. So then all of a sudden, we just got word that we were not going to deploy as an entire battalion, but we were all going to be sent to Vietnam as replacements. Because there's so many people wounded and dead. Yeah, of course, but they didn't tell us that. Though. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't know that part of it. You okay. know, we were just we just we were just told change in plans. Fellas. Right, that's uh, exactly right. That's, yeah. that's it. basically change in plan. You're not deploying as an entire uh, battalion, which we had trained together with all the same guys together. Yeah. So we had been together for maybe six months in terms of training and running up and down the hills of uh, Hawaii and and, uh, and learning tactics and everything like that, so that we had learned how to work together. They now broke us all up and sent us all to Vietnam as replacements. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going to be sent to guys or to units that don't even know who you are. Right. right. And you, you went over to Vietnam in September of 67? Uh, right. I arrived in Vietnam in September of 67. Uh, we d deployed out of uh, Camp Pendleton around July uh -huh. uh, because what happens then is once you're uh, designated to, to uh, Sent, be sent to Vietnam, we would be sent to Camp Pendleton where we would pick up additional training. Okay. You know, uh, what they call staging battalion. Uh -huh. uh, and then from you know, complete the training there, then they send you over you know, uh, uh, to Vietnam. So I would say probably, you know, I was at Camp Pendleton from, you know, kind of toward the end of July to August, and then, then we deployed to uh, Vietnam, and then I was in Vietnam in September. You okay, know. and then you initially go to Da Nang, and then you you get out to your company pretty quickly. Well, actually, so what happens then? Now, now I'm deployed with a bunch of guys that I came, I served served with, and trained with in Hawaii. You know? Right. So, for, so we landed in Da Nang, and that's division headquarters. So now, you know, I've been assigned to the First Marine Division. Uh -huh. Well, the, the division headquarters, they will assign you to the regiment. So we were assigned to Seventh Marine Regiment. And that was on Hill 55, you know, so now that we got chucked off the Hill 55. And then, so there was about uh, 13, 14 of us that we all went together out the Hill 55. Uh -huh. And then at Hill 55, they, then they, they assigned you to different battalions then. So we got assigned to 3rd Battalion, which was now located on Hill 37, which is further into the um, uh, inland, uh, 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 about 35 miles southwest of Da Nang. And all 13, 14 of us got sent to uh, uh, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, uh -huh. and uh, th they were on Hill 37. So I was thinking to myself, hey, this is great, you know, I mean, at least I'm going to be with guys that I serve with who know who I am. Because yeah. I'm also 
you know, aware of the fact that we're in the Asian war here, you know, and <laughs> there might be some people who, who could very easily mistake me for the, you know, for being the enemy. And, right. and or you run across some trigger happy Marine, you know, I mean, yeah. thing, bad things could happen to me, you know. So I thought, well, here I'm going to be with guys that I serve with who know me. And so, and, and so we get out to Hill 37 right there and, and we, they make us fall out in formation and, you know, some sergeant comes out and he said, you know, okay, 13 of you are going to Kilo Company and one's going to Mike, you know, I'm going, uh -huh. hey, you know, that's cool. What are my well, chances, right? I'm going to go, right. you know, I'm going to be one of the 13, right? Yeah. Read 13 names off and <laughs> I'm, holy mackerel, I'm standing that. by myself. And they said, Chong to Mike Company. And I go, by myself going into the company. To a company, I don't even know anybody there, you know. So, you know, I show up, you know, yeah. into at the Mike Company hooch there, and I walk in, and everybody turns around and look at me, and they're wondering, <laughs> "Oh my God!" Oh my gosh! Because <laughs> infiltrator. Well, no, they thought at first I was a Vietnamese uh, Marine or something like that. I'd come in for, or I was probably a Kit Carson scout or something, or some of the guys that even in their lifetime uh, had never even met an Asian in, yeah. in, you know, before. So some of them thought I was a Native American, you know? Right. So <laughs> guys from Wyoming or Minnesota. Or right, no exactly. Good. They were, and, and they were, um, so it was, it was quite an experience, you know, the so suddenly to run, you know, go, you know, go, go assigned to a company in which I knew nobody. And I go, holy mackerel, this, you know, this can, you know, this is not a good thing, you know? I wonder how you adjust to that being, you know, being the new guy, whether you're Asian or not, but just being the new guy in a, in a remote outpost like that where you've got guys who've, who've seen battle and are seasoned, and every time you, a new guy would come in, they're thinking, is this some guy that's gonna get us killed by screwing up because he's not experienced? So how did you, what'd you do? Well, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I. You know, I, uh, the guys that I served with were, maybe they were extraordinary or special guys or whatever. I, you know, I, I, I never got called any names. I never got treated any different from any other Marines. Um, I, of course, you know, you're absolutely right. The guys that you get, you know, assigned to or you guys you serve with, everybody looks at you, you're the new guy. They want to know, can I depend on you, you know, when things get tough? You know, and are you going to be there, you know, with me uh, fighting, you know, right. or are you going to yeah. be the guy that's just going to be, you know, cowering or running from the fight, you know, and, you know, for me, I realized that. And, you know, I, there was no way that I was going to let anybody down, you know, and, and, and not only that, to, sh to shame myself, you know, or dishonor myself was just unthinkable, you know, for, for me. So, you know, when I went there, it was just with the idea, I'm gonna prove myself, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut, I'm just gonna listen to what everybody else has to say, try to learn from them and not make any mistakes whatsoever. Keeping your and, mouth shut's and, a real good idea. Right, <laughs> exactly, and you know, just listen to what the veterans there have to say. You know? yeah. And um, First time you're under fire, what happens? <laughs> you got an incident there, right? Yeah, well, I, I went out, I was on a patrol uh, with, a, with a squad I had been uh, assigned to. And so, you know, we were running the patrol and we're wa walking down this uh, trail right there. And all of a sudden we take incoming fire, you know? So, you know, I get down, you know? And, you know, so I'm, I'm looking for, see where the fire came from, because I knew it came from the right, but I didn't know exactly where the location was, you know. So I'm looking around, and then I turn around, and I look up in front of me, there's this Marine, you know, his name was Ray Kennedy. And he's, and I see him staring at me, you know. And I'm going, what the heck is he looking at? I'm thinking, is there an enemy behind me or what, you know? And he's staring at me, and then he, and then he just kind of turn around. Basically what it was, it was snipers just trying to take a couple of shots at us, you yeah. know. So anyway, we got up and we moved on. Later on that day, Ray, who had been in Vietnam by then, he was about six months and one of the old veterans guys, you know, one of the yeah. guys who were real seasoned and been through a, a, a lot of uh, uh, battles and all that, says, said, said to me, he goes, he goes, that's pretty good, Chong. He goes, you know, <laughs> usually first time, you know, when some boot come in, you know, when you hear he get, get shot at, you know, you just flat on the ground, you know, staring, right. you know, with your uh, face into the ground, you know. He goes, well, but the veterans are the ones who, <laughs> face where the, sh where, the uh, where the sound of the gun guns coming from yeah. you know so that you know what you're going to be shooting at and you see if somebody's coming at you and he goes and that was pretty good Chong you know you did all right 
you know, it's kind of counterintuitive in a way. All that infantry training, they're training you, you, as soon as you get fired on, you charge into the fire, you know, or you're heading that direction or whatever, and you think, charge in the right direction, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but really, I mean, that's the only way you take care of it. Um, so you, you pretty quickly take over a leadership position. You end up you know, being head of a killer team, uh, which is what we call special ops today. And you're a squad leader, so you've got a squad of men that you're in charge of. You've got a killer team that you're in charge of. And um, Right. I was, um, I, I, I think I was pretty fortunate, you know, because when I was in the Marine Corps, I, you know, during the period of time before I went to Vietnam, I had uh, received two meritorious promotion. Uh -huh. I've been... Um, meritoriously promoted to private first class right out of boot camp being you know top 10 percent uh -huh. you know, in my platoon and then I had uh, been meritoriously promoted to corporal which is E4 right and that was because I came in first in a non-commissioned officer school uh -huh. uh, so I had received um, a meritorious promotion so when I went to Vietnam I was already a corporal I was an I E4 see. so you know I was in Vietnam and I guess maybe for two months or something like that and I guess I proved myself enough that the platoon commander um, was uh, had conf was confident enough to make me a squad leader and an E5 and, well that's a job for an E5 but I wasn't a promoter to an E5 yet I was still a corporal okay and then so and and then the other and the uh, other guys even Marines who had been there longer than I had been uh, who were seasoned veteran um, Accepted me as being their squad oh, wow. leader, you know. So I was, I was very fortunate. That's then, great. You know. Now, and this killer team. Uh, tell me what <laughs> what a killer team does. Well, uh, we we were stationed out in the middle of basically no man's land. Uh, we were about seven miles away from the closest Marine unit, and our closest friendly uh, force was a Green Beret camp that was about five miles away called Tin Duck. Uh -huh. So we were at the outer reaches of the Marine uh, area of operation. That's scary. Uh -huh. You know, it was right <laughs> and on a hill called Hill 52, which was held by two platoons from my company, of which it was a first and third platoon, which I was a member of third platoon. So that's about 70 men? About 70 men, yes. Yeah. And then, the, and then we had mm -hmm. another platoon that was on a, a hill that was about three miles away from us, uh, which would be a Hill 25, and that held about 30 men, 30, 37 Marines. I'd rather held be that with hill. you than with the 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's, <laughs> it, the, the, it, it was pretty scary uh, in terms of over the guys over at Hill uh, 25, although right. they, they were very, very salty Marines. You know, yeah. they, they thought they were really bad, you know, and they and they had a staff sergeant that was probably as bad as you could be, you know. <laughs> but um, so we were right in between uh, Charlie's Ridge, which was a mountain range that uh, was between Laos and Vietnam, uh -huh. and then and then we were and then uh, and then on our other on the other side was what was called the Anwa Valley, which was where it was an NVA stronghold and where. Um, uh, Lieutenant James Webb at that time writes in Fields oh, sure. of Fire. That's yeah. the Anwa Basin. Later, Secretary of the Navy. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. That's when he talks about the Anwa Basin. That was, the, we were right in the middle of that between the Anwa Basin and uh, Charlie's Ridge. Uh -huh. And so our job was to stop the infiltration of the North Vietnamese Army from Laos, then crossing through our territory into the Anwa Basin. And that was. That was our job, and they would come so the Ho Chi Minh Trail would run through the Charlie's Ridge. Uh -huh. And so uh, that was our job to stop it. So because we were out there basically by ourselves, we had a company commander that was, uh, um, it was not a, a, what do you call a usual type of a, a Marine commander. He was kind of a, a guy that was not afraid to use different tactics. Uh -huh. And so the rule at that time for Marines was that we all had to wear helmets. Whenever we left the hill uh, on patrol, ambush, operation, we all had to wear helmets. We all had to wear flag jackets. And there were specific rules in regards to what we were supposed to be wearing. You know, uh -huh. The problem with that was really, you know, the idea behind it was good to protect your body and all that. But the bad thing about it was that it made a lot of noise at night and when you're clanking and, and it also is a lot of weight you're carrying. So, 
he formed uh, this uh, six-man killer team, which we refer to as a killer team. As today, they refer to special operations. Uh, it was an all-volunteer uh, killer team. Six men it required yeah, you, that you be a veteran. You were chosen, not appointed, or not not volunteered by anybody. Mm -hmm. You had to volunteer person, you know, yourself. Right. And uh, it was six men basically. And what we would do is we would go out. Uh, without wearing helmets, using soft covers, no flak jackets, carry maximum amount of ammunition. Everything's taped to stay quiet. Correct. Uh, and and then um, and a minimum amount of food. We would stay out for four days and three nights. Uh -huh. You know, and so we would be in contact with the unit strictly by by radio, and and then with the, the food we carry, we won't carry. One three C ration, one for each day, you know, and and so that we could carry the maximum amount of ammunition and um, firepower because there's only six of us, you know. There were no fat marines. No, there was no. <laughs> there was no fat marines. <laughs> if there were fat marines, they're dead marines. You yeah. Know? And so we would go out and stay out, you know, for uh, th uh, uh, four days and three nights. And uh, just set up ambush. Setting up ambushes and moving to different areas and going into areas where um, intelligence would tell the captain where there have been NVA movements and all that. So, you know, we would set up in that area, like usually what happens, hide during the day, move during the night to, to an uh, to a ambush area. And staying off trails. S absolutely. Yeah. Stay off of trails, move as like quietly as possible. Right. You know, and, um, you know, a lot of what you, uh, you know, a lot of what you call noise discipline. And so, and then we had six guys, all of us who are very experienced veterans by that time. So it, you didn't need to tell anybody what to do. So if something happened, everybody would almost instinctively be able to operate like a team and know what to do.